Um, technology is kind of working its way up the food chain and more and more things are being automated. So banking is a, a very logical place for that to happen. Can't wait for robot um, der derivatives traders. <laughs> the Financial Survival Network. Now more than ever. And welcome. You are listening to watching the Financial Survival Network. I'm your host, Kerry Lutz. It's <clears throat> 11524. The month is already half over. And the insanity, will it ever cease? John Rubino, rubino.substack.com with us now. John, layoffs, especially in tech, but also banking, are starting to spike. And maybe the vaunted employment numbers are finally going to go against the narrative. Hey, Kerry. Well, yeah, we'll see where this goes. But these are big numbers that are coming out lately. Um, well, Citigroup was 20,000 layoffs. <laughs> but that's that's more of a that's not an economy thing. That's a business thing. Citigroup um, is trying to um, restructure so that um, so that they're not a big incompetent bank that can't make any money, you know, and, and yeah. uh, it's going to take 20,000 layoffs, apparently. But a lot of tech companies are are laying people off, too. And I think part of that, okay, do you know that trend of um, having two tech jobs at the same time? Yeah. Where, yeah, where this might be partially a response to that, where where people, um, you know, let's, let's say a coder or somebody, he takes a job and he figures out he can do that job in four hours a day. So he goes out <laughs> and applies for an entire new full-time job. And then he does them both in nine hours a day or whatever. I, I can't imagine that tech companies appreciate that, right? And they know no. what's going on. So double dip. So, it's a double. double dip. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. It sounds like good money, though. I mean, if you're uh, if you're a well-paid coder, but you got two full-time jobs. But anyhow, um, part of this could be that the tech companies are uh, are making sure that you know, their employees aren't already working somewhere else, you know, and get rid of the ones that they don't trust. But uh, part of it is that the economy is slowing down. You know, there's a, there are a lot of signs now that uh, that um, consumer spending is going to be lower going forward. That commercial real estate is a catastrophe. That um, housing is going to be flooded with new inventory. Car loans are uh, going bad at um, a record rate. Credit card delinquencies are way up. You know, there's an awful lot of reasons to expect layoffs and, and we're starting to see it happen now. There's a, um, a website that tracks this called um, layoffs.fyi. So uh, like <laughs> layoffs.fyi, uh, I love it. Yeah, and it's just a, it's just a real time, um, um, sort of like a, uh, a spreadsheet that shows you who's laying off, how many people and you know when it started and stuff like that. So. Uh, it's it's got some big names on it on the current list and some big numbers. So we'll see. Wow. But, uh, that's potentially a big deal. If these layoffs start to uh, snowball, then yeah. that's that's the catalyst. You know, we don't know what the catalyst is going to be for the next recession, but uh, that could be one of them. Early well, layoffs. Jobs, definitely. No question. Uh, I looked uh, while you were talking about Citibank. Uh, they've got 240,000 employees. Um, globally, worldwide, and uh, they still think their headquarters is in lower Manhattan, but we won't get into that. It's actually on Park Avenue. But I guess if you live up in Washington Heights, it's lower Manhattan. Their equity in 2022, so we're going back a year here, and this is 2022, so they probably got 250,000 employees and their equity is at 200 plus billion. And, uh, you know, hey, it's kind of a rounding error. I wonder how many of them will be overseas, how many will happen here in the US. Well, now they're saying at the end of 2023, they had 200,000 workers excluding Mexican employees. Point is, uh, they're cutting 10% of the workforce. They they specifically exclude their Mexican employees from their headcount. <laughs> I don't know why. It's probably That's, impossible to know. Rude. Hey, how many cartel members are working for the? For the <laughs> not the are, those, but, those Mexicans but it make it so hard. Sneaky. Yeah, you, get, yeah. you can't count them because they're always moving around. Yeah, it right. seems okay. to be 
there's a debate how many employees they have um because Reuters is saying they had 239,000 but this is through 2026 so if i infer it correctly a lot of it will be coming through attrition as well and john do you, we don't need banks the way we used to need them right we don't need well, these branches what do they do see the, see the thing about finance is that it's pretty fungible you know one one investment banker can get the deal done just as easily as the next investment banker you know and the bank teller can do the same you know one bank teller can do the same job as another so mm -hmm. I, I think you could scale back the banking industry by half and not see a bit of a deterioration in the job you know you know and, you just you just replace people with atms basically how often do you go to the bank anymore? I mean, I seldom ever go. If I need to do a wire, I generally like to go to the bank to do it because I don't trust myself on the computer, even though I've done many of them. If it's enough money, I'll do it. Otherwise, unless, or I need to open a new account or something. Otherwise, I never step foot in the place, John. Yeah, yeah. Um, technology is kind of working its way up the food chain and more and more things are being automated. So banking is a, a very logical place for that to happen. Can't wait for robot um, okay, deri derivatives traders. <laughs> hey, robot robot bank tellers. I mean, uh, you can well, see yeah. it. They'll just hire some Optimus uh, robots from Tesla, and uh, you won't even see a live human being in the uh, in the branch except for the the guys that service the robots, right? Well, I mean, when, when you do go to a teller, a lot of what you do is simple verbal commands that mm -hmm. they um, actuate. And yeah, um, next generation AI is going to be able to understand those commands. Um, and it'll be able to, you know, if, you, if you're if you depositing checks, it'll be able to scan the checks, um, put mm -hmm. them in your account, and then give you back some cash if you want. You know, you there's no reason why chat GPT, yeah. Right, you scan your checks at home now, at least I do. I use the app, Wells Fargo City, and you just take a chase, you take a picture of the check, and it gets deposited, and then you keep a copy of it for a few days afterwards to make sure nothing happens to it, and then you dump it. You know, it's yeah. the age of the AI bank teller is coming with us. What I want to see is the AI lawyer and the AI judge. Then we'll know yeah. we arrived. Yeah, well, you know, the, the AI paralegal is here today. Yeah. So they just have to work their way up just a little bit. I, I You know, I think litigation is going to be the final thing, you know, where you're yelling at each other in, in the courtroom. <laughs> but, uh, that you know, most of the rest of law is kind of cookbook. Same thing with medicine. You know, you, you go into your doctor and say, I have these symptoms. They're either going to look it up in their head because they remember it, or they'll look it up in a book or online you know, these symptoms, what are the possible diagnoses and what are the treatments? And that it's all right there, you know? So AI could do that too. So yeah, a lot of this stuff is going away. Hey, so on January 3rd, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Roberts, said, I predict that human judges will be around for a while until he retires, hopefully, <laughs> and the sooner the better. But with equal confidence, I predict that judicial work particularly at the trial level, will be significantly affected by AI. Now, look, like, if it comes to a judge or an AI, I mean, you know, the judge could be paid off. Remember that saying, I think it was Francis Bacon, where the lawyer goes to him and he's outraged because he took money from the other side. He said, Your Honor, I'm outraged. You took money from my adversary. You know, how could you do this? And he replied straight face. Well, why don't you pay me too? And then we can have an honest trial, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're coming to here. I think AI yeah. judges, I think well, but, I think it's in the offing. But they can be hacked too. So, you know. Just, and so can the real just ones. It's like voting machines, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess we're never going to get a fair trial. You know, but, but you know, it is nice. But thing you might get a fast one at least. Justice delayed is justice denied. Hey, you wait two years to get screwed and wait a month to get screwed. What's the difference? Yeah. Well, you know, have you seen that video of uh, it's a young guy, kind of a Hispanic looking young kid um, who um, there is a drone flies in front of him and says, you are under arrest. 
<laughs> and uh, and gives him handcuffs to put on and takes him in. And then there's an automated jail where there's like, a you know, the phone um, answering system when you call the bank or something like yeah. that. It, for this, press this and this, press that. And and he's in jail. He never sees a human. Yeah. And uh, and uh, and that's where he ends up at the end of the video. He has yet to see a human, but he has been tried and convicted and he's in prison. And, uh, you know, that that's disturbingly close to a system that could easily happen pretty soon here. Yeah, well, like, hey, with a 99% conviction rate in uh, federal court, you know, hey, China's, the only difference between us and China is they have a 100% conviction rate. And then the sentence is right away two behind the ear in a field. But, you know, um, hey, it, it could be, you know, it could definitely happen. So mm -hmm. it looks like we're getting to that uh, point. And uh, that's kind of Big Brother-esque, right? Oh, yeah, I'd say so. Now, you know, now, now it gets dark because for real, mm -hmm. um, the, the ability of um, the military industrial complex and the intelligence community to surveil you, to plant evidence to arrest you and like you said it's a 99 um, percent conviction rate with the feds because they're they're able to say listen we got the power of the federal government we can throw millions of dollars at convicting you so just plead guilty to this lesser offense and your your um public defender lawyer says well uh, you know you should probably do that because yeah. uh, i don't your, have millions of dollars. public ai uh, yeah. your public ai defender yeah yeah <laughs> And so, then, uh, and then an AI jail too, man, because yeah, too expensive. Well, see, the, the thing is, that's right? for for, uh, for political dissidents. This whole thing is is closer to the truth than we would like to admit, because this this kind of thing could be done, and you know, the people in charge would love to do it as soon as they're able to. They already do versions of it, so. Mm -hmm. This is coming. We have a civil war. That's all there is to it. Yeah. You know? Well, don't forget pre-crime member uh, mm -hmm. minority report. So if you think the guy might commit a crime, even though there's a minority report, like why wait for him to commit the crime and kill they're, somebody? They're Just already doing them now. Well, no, they're they're already doing that with uh, a sort of a social credit score slash pre pre crime thing where um, if you show up on uh, some kind of a flagged database you can't buy a gun for instance which hey, you know you can't I, that's, get on that's an the airplane. first step yeah you can't you can't fly we have a no fly list and um, those things can be arbitrarily increased by adding more names you know and and there's nothing you can really do about it if you're on the no fly no. list um and the police are the ones who put you there who are you going to call you know the cops will say well you know you're on there because we decided you needed to be on there what's your point you know and hey i'll give you a perfect example of ai like screwing me over on the tesla if you get five warnings on your fsd it's automatically suspended for a week and you can't send a, a tweet to elon to say hey this wasn't right. Like I've had it at times where it just wrongly kicked me off the AI, you know, kicked me off the FSD. And, you know, that's like that old uh, saying from uh, Donovan, Jay Donovan, I think he was Reagan's uh, labor secretary. Uh, where do I go to get my reputation back? Uh, where do I go to get my full self-driving back? <laughs> so full self, that's what that stands for, full self-driving? Yeah, FSD, yeah, he, which isn't he, really... It's a full self-destruct mode because if you just leave it to the car, you will die very shortly. Okay, I, I was going to say you don't want to be turning that on in Florida traffic. Jeez. Well, yeah, that's, that's especially a... where you want it because yeah. if you want to take it, if you want to rest and close your eyes for a couple of minutes, you're in bumper to bumper traffic. It's perfect for that. But there's a camera in there that tells you that starts ringing alarms and everything. You're sleeping, wake up, wake up. And then it kicks you off the FSD. So <laughs> even when you need the thing most, you can't, you can't even take advantage of it. That happened to me also, you know, I've just taken a, I was just closing my eyes for a minute and man, the nanny came on and it's like, forget about it. But uh, Hey, so what about the uh, office vacancy rates in New York? I heard it's like over a third um, 
you know, that New York, you think as the office building capital and LA and uh, Chicago, all these big cities and nobody's in there, they're see-through and you can't, you can't even like uh, repurpose these buildings that got to be knocked down. Well, San Francisco is where it's worse, but it's bad in a lot of other big cities. And part of that is that people got a chance to work at home during the pandemic. And they never want to go back to office life. Um, and part of it is just, uh, you know, money was cheap. There were too many buildings built. And so now the, the disturbing part of this is that these buildings are not generating enough cash flow to cover their loans. So they're going to be sold at big losses at some point. Those losses are going to be primarily on the balance sheets of local and regional banks who are going to have to report the losses, which will spook their um, their depositors into pulling their money out, which forces the banks to sell even more assets at big losses, and so on until the uh, the small bank sector in the U.S. just blows up. Yeah. So that's that's what the that's what those office buildings mean. It's not just a one sector story. It spreads over to the banking sector. And then, then it spreads to the economy as a whole when the the federal government has to step in and bail out $3 trillion worth of uh, of deposits in the banking sector. So Sounds uh, doomed. And, and, you know, and it also sounds inevitable. Right? There's no real way around this unless something happens to, to jack up the price of um, office buildings. And, you know, if we're heading into a recession already, which we kind of are, that means office mm -hmm. buildings are going to empty out even further, become less valuable, and that's when they're going to be sold. When they, instead of being sixty percent of um, the the loan value, might be thirty percent of the loan value for a lot of these things. This is going to be Very. cataclysmic for that sector. Yeah, there's kind of uh, no way out of this that I see. Mm -mm. There's nothing they could do because people aren't going back to the office, and then you combine that with a recession. Or the few people who are working on the, in their offices or the banking sector, where presumably most people working for the banking sector are not stay-at-home jobs, right? And one other trend, I don't know if you caught it, is that uh, that the, um, what am I going to say? One other trend is that they're closing the number, going back to what we were talking about, they're actually shrinking the number of branches like by thousands of branches around the country, those are real jobs where people actually go to work, right? So yeah, at, at the moment it is. <laughs> and they're kind of, they're not exactly office buildings, but they kind of, you know, they're small office buildings mostly if they're standalone bank branches. And yeah. some of them are in bigger buildings. So yeah, you know, it's a, it's, it's a real thing that's happening. And that, okay, so that's the commercial real estate part. The housing part is equally scary because because mm -hmm. um, you've got um, Airbnb entrepreneurs who went out and bought 17 houses a piece or whatever, and, and um, now we're going to have to sell them pretty soon. And then you've got boomers who have to downsize. You know, that we've been putting this off as a generation for a really long time, but um, there's a, an increasing number of 70-year-olds um, who need hip replacements um, are, are finding themselves in three-story McMansions, which is a really bad place to be when your hip flakes out. So they're going to have to downsize. And then Wall Street. <laughs> yeah. Yes, me too. <laughs> and and so um, Wall Street is the final piece of that puzzle where all the, um, the private equity guys bought millions of houses thinking they would just jack up the rent and make a fortune. But uh, the Had rents are not high enough. Yeah. yeah, it worked for a while. But uh, they, lately, they've been paying full price plus 20% in a bubble market. So now uh, there's a whole subgenre of um, videos on YouTube of guys going around to, hey, I'm in Las Vegas and uh, look at this house here. Um, yeah, yeah, I've seen that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, it's been marked down from a million to 600,000 already and still nobody's buying it. You know, that that's happening out there. And that's going to cause a, um, a deluge of supply. At some point, you want one so, would think, one would yeah. think, one would think. Yeah, well, hey, that'll be interesting to see how they deal with that one. Uh, hey, in the meantime, we got an energy shortage, global electricity shortage. You know, average person now in the United States, it used to be we had an average outage per year of like six minutes. It's now up to like thirty something minutes. Somebody told me recently, and 
that only makes sense that uh, uranium prices are going to go up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uranium got a nice pop this last week because, um, oh, how do you pronounce that company's name? Kazataprom? Okay. Anyhow, yeah. From Kazakhstan. Yeah. 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 And so that's the biggest, that's, it's like the, um, oh, Saudi Aramco. Yeah. Of uranium, you know, it's right. bigger. Saudi Aramco is bigger than Exxon, but it's just a state-owned company, so we don't think of it as a stock or anything. But um, Zataprom is bigger than Cameco, which is the big publicly Canadian, traded yeah. um, um, uranium company. So they, Zataprom, just announced that they're having production troubles, <clears throat> and it's looking like maybe ten percent less next year than they thought they were going to produce. So that riled up the uranium market, and it popped up to a hundred dollars a pound. Um, it was some um, thirty bucks a pound a little over a year ago. So uranium is in a, a startling bull market right now, and the uranium stocks, like I on my Substack, I have a uranium stock portfolio, and that's basically my only winner. And everything <laughs> else is down, but the uranium stocks are. Uh, have rocketed. They're, they're, a couple of them have almost doubled in just um, the, the last six months or so, and the rest are up nicely. So um, that's a very hot sector. And yeah, as you said, reason. yeah, we it's, need more electricity and we're, we're going to get it from nuclear, it looks like. And it's been beaten down for uh, for over mm -hmm. a decade now. Very cyclical. Since See, the, prob the problem with nuclear is that every 15 years, one of its plants melts down. And that scares everybody. And then, you know, the market mm -hmm. goes out of favor. Um, and then it takes a long time to come back into favor. So hopefully this time around, you know, when the next thing melts down, we'll go, all right, you know, Three Mile Island didn't kill anybody. Um, <laughs> Fukushima didn't kill very many people. Let's just yeah. keep this in perspective and, yeah. uh, and not shut down all, all our nuclear plants. You know, I think that there's a good chance that happens this time around. And yeah, no, they've gotten very expensive. The modular ones might uh, be a plus. We'll see. That remains yet to be seen, but definitely around the world, globally, nuclear is where it's at. So uh, this is your note here. Doomberg now thinks peak oil will never come thanks to new extraction technologies. And I, I can tell you, I went out to Canadian oil fields up in uh, Saskatchewan that were given up for dead and uh, through, you know, rejiggering horizontal drilling, these fields are at some point going to be producing more than they were in their peak. And there's still, a, there was only about 90 some odd percent of the oil left untapped. Even though uh, the current admin has done its best to kill oil, I don't know if you've been reading the article, especially in Zero Hedge, John, that uh, U.S. oil production is at record highs with a hostile administration. You can only wonder where they'd be if Trump had been reelected. We'd be doing th we're doing 13 million barrel equivalent now. We'd probably be doing 15 or 16 million. Well, here, here's Doomberg's thesis, and it's really interesting. Um, they're saying that, yeah, we have new technologies for uh, fracking, basically, for getting oil out of the ground in places where we couldn't use it. Yeah. Uh, but natural gas is an unwanted comp a side effect, you know, side product of, of uh, fracking oil. Correct. So right now we're just flaring it off or, or selling it incredibly cheaply. But there, there are new um, refineries coming online that can take natural gas and break it, and the other stuff that comes with natural gas, break them down, turn them into petroleum products. So you have to start counting natural gas as oil in your calculations. And that means uh -huh. that there's basically unlimited oil for as far as the eye can see, because there's natural gas everywhere. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, so it's interesting about nat gas is that uh, you have two types dry gas, wet gas. Wet gas has distillates, condensates in it natural gas, liquids. And that's worth basically what a barrel of oil is worth. Pretty close. And then you got dry gas, where at the current price, like most of those wells are unprofitable, they shut in production. Once you could take dry gas and do the same thing to it that you do with wet gas, uh, all bets are off because there's we have hundreds and hundreds of years supply. And if what you're saying comes to fruition, I mean, literally, 
the water coming out of your tap could be more costly than what a barrel of oil or a gallon of gas is going to cost. Because it's just a question of capacity constraints at that point. Yeah, yeah, uh, which is very interesting on a lot of levels because um, then then energy will not be inflationary. In other words, oil won't be going up all the time and making everything else more expensive. So you get a lot less pressure on prices. And uh, also the US would be not just self-sufficient in energy in that kind of a scenario, but a massive exporter. So the, the US is in, you know, th this helps the US relatively speaking and, and um, in, in um, objectively speaking, you know, and, and so good, so be it. But um, so we'll see. So that's the thing here about the Optimus robot. Elon Musk says when this thing really gets going, the robot division of Tesla will be worth way more than the auto version. And that basically you won't have to work unless you want to. Um, and then you get into the UBI and all that. Are you buying what he's saying that these uh, robots are really going to eliminate the need for human work? Well, automation eliminates certain kinds of work, right? You know, you don't have to wash your clothes by hand anymore. Mm. So to the extent that was your job, you don't have to do that job anymore. Um, but, you know, there's a real societal transition that has to happen as that goes on. Because a lot of people do say, you know, it's the whole post-scarcity thing where machines are doing all the, the value-added jobs. And then you have to tax the owners of the robots and then spread that money around or else you'll have a revolution. So there's going to be political pressure as this happens. And, you know, there's no doubt that it that it progresses from here in that direction. But whether we, we get all the way out where literally um, the only people who are working are doing it because they think it's fun, um, we'll see. But we're definitely headed in that direction gradually and maybe quickly pretty soon because um you know yeah, ai well, <laughs> just like how we go broke yeah you know yeah. you know slowly then quickly right because well you know once, once ai they, they call it general intelligence right mm -hmm. now they don't have that yet but general intelligence is where you can be trained to do a job and then do it and handle the um, the complexities of that job so when ai is pretty close to that then a humanoid robot like Elon Musk is making would be kind of like a person on most jobs, right? You know, same shape, <laughs> same abilities for yeah. a lot of jobs. So, yeah. So, and then then you get into the whole sex robot thing, which we probably don't want to go to, but uh, yeah. that I think is, you know, you know how porn, yeah. how porn is the, the most valuable part of the internet. Well, sex robots might be the biggest part of automation. Who knows? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, Hey, once you start, you know, you know what the guy said in Risky Business, the pimp, Guido, he said, you know, when you mess with you, you mess with a man's livelihood, you're going to have problems. You start messing with the girl's livelihoods, you're going to have problems, man. <laughs> they will. It'll be just like the Luddites storming the the looms in the 1800s, late 1800s England. Remember that that's where we get the term Luddite from where mm -hmm. they were protesting against the technology well that's when the that's when we'll start seeing uh, tesla factories be attacked here well um yeah you know if it gets out ahead of of ubi in other words if more people get laid off than are being paid not to work then yeah <laughs> it's it's an imbalanced society and it'll just explode so yeah you know this is like a 50 year thing probably but we're in the early stages of the acceleration part now. So fascinating and, and hopefully manageable. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's a brave new world out there, huh? Yeah. Yeah, hey, it really is. So what about gold? It does look like 20,000 is the base. Every time something happens where it looks like uh, the price of gold is going to crash 2,000, something happens, huh? Was well, it funny? The last three years, gold has gone up and up and bounced. It hit two thousand, bounced back down. Hit two thousand and bounced back down. Now it's it's 
correcting a little, getting near 2000 and bouncing back up. So, mm -hmm. so far, I mean, you know, a couple of bad days and gold could be back below 2000. But uh, what's happening lately is uh, 2000 is acting like support instead of resistance. And the longer that goes on, the more that idea will take hold um, in the minds of investors. And that'll be very good for the miners because then you can extrapolate out 20, you know, 2050 gold for years, which means wide margins for the miners, lots of free cash flow, and therefore higher stock prices. So, you know, this is a big deal for gold uh, mining investors. And here's hoping, you know, that... Uh, the 2000 is um, the the lowest we see in the rest of our lifetimes, and it's all up, uphill from here, you know? It could be, man. It could very well be the case, and I wouldn't doubt it for a minute. But you never know. But in the meantime, like Bitcoin, you thought, oh, well, now the ETFs, the spot ETFs are out. It's going to take off all this increased demand. And what did it do? It went down like $6,000. But did you see the, the hack tweet? supposedly hacked tweet from the SEC the night before. And that was the tip off that nothing was going to happen because the hack tweet got released. And when, since when does a federal agency issue a ruling by tweet? Doesn't happen, but uh, nothing happened to went up a little bit and then immediately came back down. So it was well, it, that, that was, sorry, uh, that, that was a case of, um, Buy the rumor, sell yes. the sell the uh, announcement. And, sell the ETF. <laughs> yeah, well, well, but Bitcoin had been going up for the month leading up to that. In anticipation, so it had a really nice yeah, yeah. anticipation, and so so it's reasonable to think the people who had some embedded profits, excuse me, on the way up would be taking some profits now. So that's that's to be expected, and uh, but but we'll have to see what these ETFs do because. I'm, I'm, to be honest, not clear about whether they're synthetic, where they're just using like futures they contracts. They are. They're not ETFs. They're ETPs. Don't forget that. If you so, look up look up Google ETP, it's an exchange traded product, and it's a tracking product. All right. If you look up, I will look it up right this second because somebody told me it's an ETP, and I said, "What is an ETP? Exchange <laughs> exchange." traded product okay listen to this are instruments that track underlying securities an index or other financial products right yeah okay so it's tracking so how do you track it right you're buying futures probably right see it, so that's not necessarily good for bitcoin at all because um they're, if they're just using derivatives, nobody's going out and buying Bitcoin and taking it off the market wh the way a physical ETF works. You would think, yeah. Yeah. Right? So, well, physical ETFs are, I'm not sure they should be legal. They're sort of a kind of almost an unethical thing where they, they just, you know, buy a bunch of uranium, take it off the market. Right. And that makes prices go up, which makes it harder for the actual users of the product, but it it's profitable to just hoard it. And so mm -hmm. it's kind of a perpetual motion machine where they, you know, they buy something, its price goes up, and they um, sell their inflated stock to buy more and so on. Um, so if Bitcoin is not going to do that, then we have to see whether it has any effect on the, the price of, um, or if Bitcoin ETFs are not going to do that, then we have to yeah, see so, whether it has any effect. Yeah, and I want to just mention that uh, Nick Santiago pointed this out to me, and then I did further research on an ETP, and... You know, technically, things like USO, that's the oil exchange, and uh, the nat gas, UNG, really almost fall into this category of ETPs because they're not actually taking the product. They're working on uh, futures and on options. And I, there are no Bitcoin options, to my knowledge, crypto options, but there are crypto futures. So they could just be an ingenious way to manipulate the market, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if it's just futures, then it is just a market manipulation um, technique for people who want to short as well as go long. You know, so you could see some hellacious corrections in uh, in Bitcoin if that's all these ETFs are. So 
So we'll see. This is an ongoing story. We have to see how this plays out because, um, you know, there's no reason why, I guess, in theory, that you couldn't have the electronic version of a physical Bitcoin fund, right? Where they just, because you can store Bitcoin on yeah. a hard drive. Yeah. But, so, but you know what is, it's just, they're, they're not ETFs. They're not. They're yeah. ETPs. And yet the whole media has misrepresented their actual, you know, their actual uh, formation here. It's like, oh, well, you have a corporation or you have an LLC. Oh, same difference. It's not. It's different. <laughs> a partnership or a corporation, it's different. And 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 the internet, it's all spot ETF this, ETF that. But according to what I heard, they're like ETPs. If I'm wrong, I, I want to be corrected. Let me know. But, uh, but they evidently... Uh, or ETPs. Anyways, your please send in your emails, put it up on YouTube here. Let us know are they ETPs or are they ETFs? Right? Because that's well, uh, that's how we get to the bottom. There already were a couple of ETFs for Bitcoin, but I think they were traded a little bit differently. Um, and here, you know, eleven funds were. Here it is. Today, it's from sec.gov. Today, the commission approved the listing and trading of a number of Bitcoin exchange-traded product shares. Okay, so explain to us, any of you smarter people than us, why this is a good thing and what difference does it make? Or are we just blowing this out of proportion? I think not. I think the devil's in the details, and we found one of the devils here, John. <laughs> well, we'll see. You know, hey, it's wouldn't it be cool story. if we broke it? <laughs> you no, know, I think if the, we uh, broke the fraud. I think the Bitcoin maximalists are on this, so we just have to see what they say. You know, yeah. have you ever interviewed Mark Jeftovic? That rings a bell, but yeah, I, I'm not sure, but I'd like he, to if he's listening. Yeah, to, uh, to interview him. Hey, I'll, so. I'll send you an invite. Okay, great. Uh, I know he would like to do some more. Um, yeah, and, and he's he's an expert on this stuff. He uh, he, right. he can I answer all know. those questions. Yeah. Hey, imagine that we actually scoop something here because all the morons in the media, you know, can't read, right? Because or they won't read. <laughs> I mean, give me a freaking break. <laughs> here, like. Fidelity calls it the Fidelity Physical Bitcoin ETP, but it's an exchange traded product. But and it aims to track the price of Bitcoin. FBTC is 100% physically backed by Bitcoin. All right, I don't believe that for two seconds, but Fidelity says it. It must be true, right? Isn't that funny? It, it has the, the it has physical in its name. Yeah. But the thing that it's physically owning is not a physical thing. <laughs> yeah. Bitcoin is computer code, basically. Well, maybe so, they'll uh, get the coins with the yeah. chip embedded in it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Pile them in a vault. Yeah. You got to laugh, man. You, yeah. you got to laugh at this. It's just so unbelievable. So border crisis, like New York, Chicago, all of these northern cities, the southern, it's, this is a throwback to like uh, the 50s and 60s, when in Houston, if somebody applied for welfare, they used to give them a bus ticket to New York or Chicago because <laughs> their benefits were better. Here, they just give them a one-way ticket. Yeah, you know, the um, the political establishment is imploding over this open border thing because, uh, you know, they originally thought it was just a way to swamp the border states and make sure that they they vote Democrat they forever. Blue. Yeah. But now the, the governors down there are just shipping them up to Chicago and New York. And the, the cities are starting to go nuts because, I, I, well, one of them, I think it's New York, literally closed a high school, put the yeah. kids on virtual learning and filled the high school up with illegal immigrants. And then uh, in, and it might be O'Hare Airport. You know, there's an airport. It might be in Chicago. I was there. O'Hare yeah. Airport. Yeah. They have a bus terminal. I went down there. I was taking the uh, shuttle bus to the airport, uh, to the hotel I was staying at. And I look around, there's curtains up there. 
And I don't look further down, there's all these immigrants like lying down in mattresses. There were hundreds of them there. It was no cops either. It's a scary, scary thing. They're just like living there. That's horrible. Well, but see, this is the end of the process because the voters up there are getting a real taste of what open borders are like. And they're coming to some con some conclusions, but they, they don't like that policy, you know? So the, the Democrats either, either have to change and adopt kind of Trumpian border policies. Yeah. Or it's going to be a bloodbath. You know, that's that is a wedge issue where um Hell where yeah. people who used to vote one way are going they're going to switch. They'll vote a different way because of this one issue. And uh, and this is, you know, closing a school, that does it. That's that's where you yeah. you draw the line, you know. Hey, yeah, pretty soon they'll they'll start like emptying out hospitals, maternity wards. You yeah. Know? <laughs> What's next? Hey, look, uh, Trump, if we're allowed to mention him, I don't think we get censored just for uttering his name. But let's say the uh, bridge term, the queen of Trump's, uh, he had the pro problem almost stopped, almost stopped. You know, it was almost over. And that was Congress's opportunity to revise the process so that these people who want to come here, get vetted, and can become legal citizens, which nobody in their right mind could ever take issue with, because that's what we want. And we don't want them to be charges of the state. And the second he walked out of the White House, that policy was reversed. And now we got 13 million, who knows, at least 13 million, maybe more. And uh, you got to wonder. You, you know, we're, we're doing things that... Um nobody in their right mind would do unless they intended to destroy the culture you know yeah. just just wipe society right Erase out you it. can't you cannot have open borders and have a stable country rome rome you, you, remember the visigoths yeah. and all yes. the uh, that's what brought down rome now granted mm -hmm. uh, their population wasn't 300 million so you know if they had like 5 million and they imported you know 2 or 3 but, million Whatever. I, no, I, I know that story. It was like half a million of Germanic tribes showed up on the border because there were um, meaner Germanic tribes at their back. And the uh, the Romans invited them in thinking, OK, cheap labor and soldiers, you know, we'll, we'll make use of these guys. But there were too many of them. They just swamped the horse. culture. Yeah. yeah. And so we're, we're basically doing the same thing. But it seems like we're doing it on purpose yeah. this time. You know? Yeah, I, exactly. This is a plan. I yeah. This is a plan. Well, the Democrats want it because it's more voters in the future, and the Republicans want it for cheap labor. At least that's the theory. But they, it doesn't seem to really be a question of economic or political interest. It's really just a question of there's some plot afoot. Hey, finally, got to finish up here. We've been going long. Chinese missiles filled with water. The hatches of their ICBMs don't work. And... Also, there was a massive hack of the Chinese Space Force where missiles were programmed basically when they're fired off to turn around and attack their launch site. Um, and this has led to a major purge of China's military and has brought into question whether they're actually in a position to attack Taiwan. Now, if we assume the story is true, this is a big issue. They were actually using rocket fuel as cooking fuel because it cooks better than uh, any other product out there. Get natural gas or petroleum, I guess, better heat distribution. I don't know. I've never tried it. But if, if you've ever cooked with rocket fuel, send me an email, kl at kerrylutz.com. I'd love to hear your experience. Wouldn't it be nice if we tried to have World War III and nobody was <laughs> capable of doing it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody's uh, rockets turned around and hit the back. Ugh. Or just yeah. didn't even yeah. fly, you know, would be, that would be uh, that would be the best thing that's happened <laughs> in the last hundred years for sure. Yeah, wouldn't it? Hey, finally, I'm considering becoming a passport bro. I'm not going to define it here. You can look it up on uh, Google. Um, hit in Thailand for the uh, first three weeks of February. If you live in Thailand particularly uh, Bangkok, please uh, send me an email to kl at kerrylutz.com. I'd love to meet you. I know we have a bunch of Thai 
followers out there because I've seen it from the analytics. I think uh, this is about it. The only other thing we didn't mention that we should have, John, was what's going on with the uh, criminal case against Trump in Atlanta. That appears to have uh, imploded. The uh, DA was having an affair with the guy who she appointed special prosecutor. Not the smartest move, but hey, the case wasn't too smart anyway. <laughs> we, we're not a competent country anymore, Carrie. I don't no, know. I mean, we there's can't not even much we can do. Political right? opposition we, properly yeah, anymore. Yeah, Jesus, we can't even cheat successfully. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, and Newt Gingrich said that he heard that um, they pushed her to file the indictment, and that's why it got leaked the day before the day that a whole Hunter Biden scandal dropped in the news, and that was to squeeze it out. Who the heck knows? But but this is like the signs of devolving into a banana republic, John. It, it is because we're, you know, we're corrupt and we're incompetent. And it, it takes yeah. two of those, the, both of those things to make a banana republic. And we seem to be there. Well, being that we're corrupt, uh, imagine if we were competent, that would really be a problem. We'd have even less freedoms than we have now. So maybe we should be grateful for that. I don't know. In any event, that's it. We'll talk to you in a couple of weeks, John. And uh, that'll be the day before I go off to Asia. Make sure you check out John's site uh, where you find his material, rabino.substack.com. And the link is in the show notes on financialsurvivalnetwork.com. If you haven't signed up for your free newsletter, please do so right away. John, we'll talk to you soon. See you, Karen.